Chapter 1 I don't want to brag or anything, but I happen to be the president of the greatest club ever invented. Chad, I said, meeting today. I'll be there, he said. Our official name is the PS38 Cartooning Club, but we call ourselves the Doodlers. We meet every Wednesday after school in the art studio, and we sit around drawing comics until the custodian kicks us out. It's the best club in the whole school, by a mile. Don't believe me? Well then, check out this lineup. Join these clubs at your own risk. Nitpickers. A group of girls, boys can join too, but let's get real, who like to knit clothes. Why it's lame. Aren't there already enough butt-ugly sweaters in the world? I made it myself. No kidding. Wizards and witches. For kids that are really into the whole fantasy thing. Why it's lame. Wearing a bath towel around the schoolyard and pretending it's a cape doesn't mean you have magical powers. Magnificus preposterous! Yikes. Problem solvers. A bunch of eggheads hanging out in the computer lab doing ridiculously hard math problems for fun. Why it's lame. Isn't it obvious? I just adore calculus. Who doesn't? Spotlight Club, for kids who are convinced they're going to be huge recording stars. Why it's lame. A, they're constantly singing in public in the hopes of being discovered. B, they can't sing. May I please have some rice? Woo, woo, woo. School Beautification Society, just what it sounds like. Why it's lame. Apparently, beautification means painting cheesy murals in the second floor boy's bathroom. This is creeping me out. See? Most of these so-called clubs look about as fun as an ingrown toenail. But the doodlers rock. And we only got started a few months ago. That's when it all came together, thanks to a glob of peanut butter. <gasps> Dramatic flashback! It was a typical social studies class. Mrs. Godfrey was babbling about some dead guy who wasn't a good enough president to get his picture on any money. Blah, 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 Franklin Pierce, blah, 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 blah. Gina had already asked about 19 completely useless questions in a row. <sighs> and I was about five seconds away from falling into a coma. Then, Glenn Swenson walked by my desk on his way to the pencil sharpener, and suddenly, things got a lot more interesting. He had food on his face. That's nothing new. Glenn usually has enough crumbs stuck on him to feed a family of four. But this was different. He had a glob of peanut butter the size of a hubcap on his forehead. He had no clue it was there. And neither did anybody else. It was hilarious. But I couldn't just crack up in the middle of class. Not unless I wanted she who must not be named to go full Godfrey on me. So I did what I always do when something funny happens. Rustle, rustle, clunk. My best drawing pen. I drew a cartoon about it. Time for another edition of Celebrity Interview. Hello, I'm Tish Dishley chatting with Glob of Peanut Butter. Hi, Tish. Tell me, Glob, how did you end up on Glenn's forehead? I was doing jumping jacks. I jumped too high, and this is where I landed. Wait, you were exercising? Yes, Tish. I've been trying to lose weight. I'm a little too chunky. The end. It was a good cartoon. Too good to keep to myself. Psst. Teddy, I say. Look at this. Nate! Yep! Is that something you'd like to share with the rest of the class? Teachers always ask that. What was I supposed to say? Yes? Then even Glenn, who's dumber than a bag of hammers, would have realized I was making fun of him. And that would have been a problem. Because whenever Glenn gets mad at people, 
He chases them down during recess and crushes them into the schoolyard fence until they can't breathe. Clang! <laughs> I decided I wanted to keep breathing. Uh, no, I'll just, um, put this away in my desk now. <laughs> Snap! She grabs it and things went downhill from there. Mrs. Godfrey stuck my drawing in her desk. Then she gave me a little pink slip of paper. Hello, detention, and hello, Mrs. Sir Wiki. Drawing cartoons during class? Again, Nate? That's three times this week. What can I say? She was right. But she didn't stop there. Mrs. Sir Wiki didn't realize it, but the next thing out of her mouth was about to change the course of cartooning history. What you need is a place where drawing cartoons is what you're supposed to do. Moment of genius! I have to admit, it was a brilliant idea, even for me. I ran and asked Principal Nichols if I could start a cartooning club. Sounds like a great idea! And the amazing doodlers have been making masterpieces ever since. Oop, it's almost three o'clock. The bell's going to ring in five, four, three, two, one. Bring! Let's go, guys! Meeting time! We all make a pit stop at our lockers, then head for the art studio. The art teacher, Mr. Rosa, is our faculty advisor. Hey, kids, he says. Let's draw! Every club has an advisor. That's school policy. But most clubs have one already in place. Miss Clark has always run the school newspaper, and Mr. Galvin has been the advisor for the science club since the last ice age. I call it a wheel. Ooh. That's okay if you end up liking your advisor. But what if you join some club and the advisor's horrible? Then you're just like that glob of peanut butter on Glenn Swenson's forehead. You're stuck. That's where the doodlers got lucky. Since we started our club from scratch, we got to decide who our advisor would be. I mean, can you imagine if we'd ended up with somebody like... Coach John! Everybody freezes. We're all thinking the same thing. What's he doing here? Did the school switch advisors on us or something? My stomach starts churning as I picture a doodler's meeting with Coach John in charge. Draw, draw faster, or you will do push-ups till you puke! Finally, Francis speaks up. Uh, where's Mr. Rosa? He asks nervously. Coach John chuckles in sort of a scary way. Did I mention the guy's a few peas short of a casserole? You can relax, scrubs, he said. I'm just babysitting until he gets here. And here I am, comes a voice from behind us. Mr. Rosa, we holler. Sorry I'm a bit late, everyone, he says as he takes off his jacket. Then he pats Coach John on the shoulder. Thanks for covering for me, Coach. Coach John grunts something in return, then waddles out of the room. Finally, we can all exhale. Listen, gang, before we get started, there's someone I'd like you to meet, Mr. Rosa tells us as we sit down. He motions toward the door. This is my colleague, Mrs. Everett. Colleague? What's that supposed to mean? This lady doesn't work at PS38. Hi, doodlers. She smiles as she pulls a folder from her tote bag. I'm delighted Mr. Rosa invited me to visit with you today. I never pass up the chance to talk about cartooning. Chad raises his hand. Are you a cartoonist? She laughs. <laughs> I'm a teacher who tries to be a cartoonist, but that's not why I'm here. I thought you'd like to see what another cartooning club is up to. Whoa, what? Did she say another cartooning club? We call it the CIC, the Cartooning and Illustration Club, she continues. We've got about 30 boys and girls at our weekly meetings. Speaking of girls, aren't there any in your club? Uh, girls? I feel my face getting warm. The guys sort of steal looks at each other, but nobody says anything. You know, she says cheerfully, there are plenty of girls who enjoy cartooning. Then she spreads a whole bunch of drawings around the table. Gawk! My jaw just about hits the floor as I look down at them. Same with the rest of the guys. 
Even Artur's eyes are as big as pie plates. He can really draw. But some of these make his stuff look like stick figures. These drawings are pro. Oop. Who, who did these? Teddy stammers. Why, the CIC, of course, Mrs. Everett answers. My students. There's a stunned silence. What students? Chad finally asks. I mean, where do you teach? I swallow hard. I think I already know the answer. But when she says it out loud, it still hits me like a brick in the head. Jefferson Middle School. Plonk. Chapter Two. Of course. Of all the schools to have a bigger and better cartooning club than the Doodlers, it has to be Jefferson. Jefferson Middle School and PS38 are arch rivals. That's how we feel about it anyway. But the kids from Jefferson don't exactly see it like that. Obnoxious Jefferson students. You can't have a rivalry between a nail and a hammer. <laughs> or a bug and a windshield. <laughs> And you know what stinks? They're right. Jefferson always beats us, always. In the whole time I've been at PS38, we haven't won anything against them, not even once. Their athletes are more athletic. It's 8-0 Jefferson! Boom! Despite the heroic efforts of PS38's goalie! Their musicians are more musical. And the winner of the Battle of the Bands is... Jefferlicious! Love their sparkly outfits, and what an amazing laser show. Even their math geeks are geekier. Jefferson, 14,500. PS 38, 3. The answer is 17.36 pi times the square root of 26.4 to the fifth. Obviously. Sure, I know that winning isn't everything. How could I not? The teachers and coaches remind us a zillion times a day. The most important thing is to do your best. Don't forget you're all winners. And have fun out there. Have fun? Hey, that's fine when you're six years old playing t-ball for Little Duckling's daycare. But after a while, that whole let's get everyone a trophy thing gets pretty tired. We're not babies anymore. We want to win. Especially against Jefferson. I wonder how long it's been since PS38 actually beat Jefferson, Teddy says. What a coincidence you should mention that, Francis chimes in. Just for kicks, I was browsing through the school archives. Just for kicks, I say. Dude, get a hobby, Teddy adds. As I was saying, Francis went on, the last time we beat Jefferson was seven years ago. Seven years? What did we win at? Teddy asks. Debating, I think, Francis answers. Debating, I said. Wow, what a thrilling victory that must have been. Ha, <laughs> Teddy said. We'll put an end to that seven-year streak next Saturday. Teddy's right. I've been trying not to think about it too much. I don't want to jinx us. But our basketball team plays Jefferson next week for the first time since last year's conference championship. Hoops nightmare! One year ago. We can beat this team, I know we can! Plonk! Kabonk! Losing by 53 points isn't all that bad. What a fiasco that was. But this year's gonna be different. We're better than we were last season, for one thing, and it's a home game for us. Wait till we get Jefferson in our gym, I said. We'll pound them! Pow! A snowball slams into my head. Everything goes dark for a second, and then I land face first in a puddle of slush. Chunks of snow are starting to slide down the back of my shirt. I jump up. Who threw that? <laughs> Losers! <laughs> At first I can't tell who they are. They're scrunched down behind a stone wall at the top of a little hill. But then one of them stands, and I see it. A purple jacket with gold sleeves and a big gold J on the chest. 
<laughs> They're from Jefferson, I say. Get them! We start up the hill, but it's no use. They've got a huge pile of pre-made snowballs. For every handful of snow we scoop up and throw at them, they send a dozen back at us. It's like an avalanche. There's only one thing to do. Retreat! We run for half a block until we're out of range. Of the snowballs, that is. But we can still hear them laughing at us. <laughs> Loud and clear. That was Nolan, Teddy says, breathing hard. Who? He lives near me, Teddy says matter-of-factly. He's kind of a jerk. Oh, really? I snap, trying to shake the snow out of my pants. Gee, he seemed like such a nice guy. I should probably explain something. Maybe you only have one middle school in your town, but in our town, there are five of them. And Jefferson's close to PS38. It's practically in the same neighborhood. That's why the rivalry is such a big deal. Because we know a lot of those kids. Could we talk about something besides Jefferson? Francis says. Good idea, Teddy and I say at the same time. Okay, Francis continues. What did you guys think of what Mrs. Everett said at the Doodlers meeting? What, I said. That Jefferson draws better cartoons than we do? I thought we weren't going to talk about Jefferson, Teddy says. I'm not, Francis says. I meant what she said about the club not having any girls. I shrug. The only answer I can come up with sounds pretty lame. I don't know. Girls can join if they want to, Teddy says. It's just that none of them have asked. We haven't asked them either, Francis says, sounding more and more like my dad. Maybe we should. Well, what if they say yes? Teddy asks. Francis gets all exasperated. That's the whole point, you pinhead! I know what Teddy's getting at. Yeah, there are some girls who probably make good doodlers. But those other ones? Yikes. Cartooning catastrophe! Ah! What if these characters join the doodlers? Kim Cressley. Draw a cartoon about you and me getting married? Or else? Urk. Mary Ellen Papowski. Want to read my comic strip? No, because I have absolutely no sense of humor. That girl whose name I can't remember. Why do you smelly boys always draw superheroes? You should be drawing unicorns. And the most horrifying potential doodler, Gina Hemphill Toms. Mr. Rosa, I think you should grade our cartoons, and I deserve an A+. I shiver but not because of the snow. The thought of Gina walking into a doodler's meeting just made my blood run cold. Hey, what about Dee Dee? Francis says. She's pretty artsy. She designs all the posters for the school plays. Ugh, she's such a drama queen, though, Teddy frowns. Everything's always an emergency or a crisis or... Teddy, Nate, Francis! Speaking of Dee Dee, I say... That sounded sort of like her. Guys, come quick, help! It is her, Teddy says as she comes closer. Acting like she's on stage, as usual. Francis shakes his head. I don't think she's acting, he says seriously. All three of us run to meet her. Dee Dee, what's wrong? Francis says. It's Chad! He's hurt! Chapter 3 When we reach Chad, he's lying on his back in the middle of the sidewalk like a flipped-over turtle. He slipped on the ice! Dee Dee hollered. I think he's dead! Take it easy, Dee Dee. You're not a doctor, and playing Nurse Ouchie in her second-grade production of Bunny Gets a Boo-Boo doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. Where does it hurt, Chad? Francis asks. My butt, Chad groans. With a flourish, Dee Dee pulls out her cell phone. 
I'll call an ambulance, she says. This is an emergency. An emergency? Teddy repeats. It's a sore butt. I wouldn't be so sure, Francis says as we help Chad to his feet. I have a different diagnosis. You probably bruised your tailbone or even cracked it. <gasps> oh, no! How tragic! Dee Dee wails, as if we just told Chad he has two weeks to live. See why Teddy called her a drama queen? She can take any situation and turn it into a major theatrical production, starring herself. Social studies. Instead of reading my report about Calvin Coolidge, I'm going to perform his life story as an interpretive dance. Lunch. I'm bleeding. I feel faint. I'm getting weak. Weaker. Weaker. That's ketchup. You stuck your elbow in Paige's french fries. Science. Everyone else's bean plant grew, but mine died. Why me? Why? Why? We ignore her. Can you walk? I ask Chad. He takes a couple steps, then winces. I can, he says miserably. But it doesn't feel very good. So Dee Dee calls Chad's mom, and we wait with him until she shows up. Come on, honey, Chad's mom says. We'll go see Dr. Krensky. <laughs> Alas, says Dee Dee as they drive off. Poor Chad. Poor Chad is right. The next day in school, he's sitting on a donut. Not that kind of donut. Honey glazed. Splurge. A medical donut, I mean. It's a giant inflatable ring, almost like a life preserver. When he walks from class to class, it looks like he's carrying a toilet seat. I have to use it whenever I sit down, he says. It takes pressure off my tailbone. So Francis was right. It was his tailbone. I feel bad for Chad, not just because he's hurt, but because, well, having a bruised tailbone is sort of embarrassing, don't you think? I mean, when you're talking about different kinds of injuries, there are good ones and bad ones. Good injury! I broke my leg while rescuing this puppy from a burning building. Oof! Bad injury. I was cleaning my ears and a Q-tip got stuck in there. Good injury. I survived a tiger attack on my jungle safari. Bad injury. The tag on my new bathing suit irritated my skin. Scratch, scratch. Good injury. I got frostbite while climbing Mount Everest. Bad injury. I popped a zit and it got infected. I've been lucky. I've never had one of those really embarrassing injuries. Knock on wood. I arrive outside Mr. Rose's classroom. Tap, tap. Yes, he says, opening the door. Is someone there? Wonk. <laughs> Good gravy, Mr. Rosa yelps in surprise. Nate, are you all right? Yeah. I'm okay, I say as I get off the floor, because I have such supportive friends. <laughs> well, since you're all here, Mr. Rosa continues, I'd like to mention that Mrs. Everett made a good point yesterday about inviting some girls to join the doodlers. Not this again. Why do we have to change the club? Why mess with perfection? Boys aren't the only ones who wind up in detention for drawing comics, Mr. Rosa chuckles. Girls can be pretty cartoony, too. So do some recruiting, you three. Hop to it. We watch as he disappears down the hallway. Recruiting, I grumble. Whoop to stink and do. Who are we supposed to recruit? Teddy wonders. Guys, Francis says. We talked about this yesterday, remember? The answer's right there. Uh, right where? All I see is a poster for the dance tomorrow night. Dee Dee drew that, Francis explains. I told you she was a good artist. I examine the poster. Beach party dance. Shake your tail feathers. Wear beach attire. Don't be a crab. Friday, 7.30 to 10.30. Admission, $5. Okay, 
Three cheers for Dee Dee. She can draw a half-decent seagull. But why does that mean she gets to join the doodlers? I don't want our meetings turning into the amazing Dee Dee show. Aren't there any other girls we can recruit? I ask hopefully. How about Sheila? She takes dance lessons on Wednesdays, Francis says. Paige? She babysits her brothers after school. Megan? She hates to draw. Teddy jumps in. What about Jenny? I cringe. Jenny would be an awesome doodler. That's obvious. But there's one huge problem. Our tour's a doodler, too. And don't ask me why. Jenny and our tour are still an item. So if she joined the club, Wednesday afternoons would probably turn into doodling and canoodling. Your drawing is the bestest, Snooky Bear. No, yours is the bestest, Sugar Bunny. Ugh! I'm supposed to draw comics while those two count each other's freckles? I'd rather eat egg salad. Hey, I'd rather bathe in egg salad. I already talked to Jenny, I lie. She can't do it. Then it's decided, Francis declares with a clap of his hands. Dee Dee it is. Teddy grimaces. Who's gonna ask her? Not me, Francis says. I have work to do with the computer lab. You two figure it out. You do it, Teddy and I say in unison. No, you do it, we both say again. We'll shoot for it, Teddy says, holding out a hand. Odds or evens? Evens, I say automatically. I always pick evens. Once, twice, three times, shoot! Odds, Teddy says. I win! Congratulations, Nate. The job's all yours. Rats. I knew I should have picked odds. I walk into the cafetorium, racking my brain for a way to weasel out of this. Then I remember the last thing Mr. Rosa told us. Hop to it. And talk about timing. Guess who's sitting at the very first table? Dee Dee and her flock of BFFs from the drama club. Chit-chat, 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 chat Guess I might as well get this over with. Chit-chat, 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 chit-chat. Mm-hmm. Dee Dee. Chit-chat, chit-chat, chit-chat. She doesn't hear me. Why am I not surprised? Dee Dee! I yell a few dozen times. Finally, she turns around. Can I talk to you? I ask. Over here? Ooh, talk to her about what? Nobody ever tells me anything. Wait, who is that? It's that detention kid. What is it, Nate? Dee Dee says. Hmm? Uh, well, it's... I stammer. I, um, wanted to ask you something. Okay, go ahead. Well, I saw that poster you made, the one for the dance, and I thought maybe you might want to... Um, zing! A half-eaten sandwich flies past us, nearly clocking me in the head. For a second, I lose my train of thought. I, uh, I forgot what I was saying, I tell her, a little flustered. It's okay, Dee Dee chirps. I know what you were about to ask, and sure, I'd love to go to the dance with you. Chapter 4 Okay. Let's get something straight. I'd ask Mrs. Godfrey to the dance before I'd ask Dee Dee. But I guess that doesn't matter now. Super slow-mo instant replay. I'd love to go to the dance with you. Jaw-dropping in horror. What matters is, she thought I was asking her. Before I could explain, she'd already turned lunchtime into show and tell. Hey, everyone! Guess what Nate just asked me? Dee Dee has a voice that could blow a hole in a battleship. So right then and there, the whole cafetorium knew. She and I were going to the dance together. Yuck, 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 yuck. Pick me up at 7.15! Dee Dee called to me as she left. Don't forget your beach clothes! But, what? <laughs> That's how I ended up here. Half a block from her house at 7.10 on Friday night. 
What a mess. For a second, I think about going home, but that would never work. The parent patrol would see to that. Your son was supposed to take my daughter to the dance, and he never showed up. He what? Besides, I don't want to miss the dance. They're cheesy, but I like school dances. And I actually know what I'm doing out there, unlike some people. Check out these so-called moves. PS38 Dance Floor of Shame. Francis. He's my best friend, but what a stiff. He moves like a three-toed sloth in a full body cast. Am I doing it right? Uh, no. The cheerleading squad. They dance together in a big group, and whenever a good song starts, they all go completely berserk. <gasps> boom chicka boom chicka squeal! OMG, I love this song! Seth Quincy, a.k.a. Q-Tip. Picture a scarecrow in a wind tunnel. When Q-Tip starts flailing around, his elbows and knees turn into lethal weapons. Doof! Faculty chaperones! Nothing says awkward like the math teacher doing the robot. Hey, you guys, look at Mr. Staples. Is that the robot or the Frankenstein? Anyway, it looks like I'm stuck taking Dee Dee to the dance. But how do I do it without giving her the idea that I... Nope. Like her. Answer? I have absolutely no idea. But I definitely don't want everybody thinking I'm Dee Dee's soulmate. I've got to tell her right now that we are going to the dance as friends. Ding dong. Hi, Nate, Dee Dee says, opening the door. I'll get my coat. Yikes. Where did Dee Dee shampoo her hair? In the produce section at Grocery Town? I'm so surprised by the pyramid of fruit on her head that I forget about my just friend speech. I guess I'll tell her while we walk to the dance. You know, these bananas are heavier than they look. I was talking to Miranda, who helped decorate the cafetorium, and she told me the fruit looked fabulous. Have you ever tried a kiwi? They are delicious. I go on an audition next week, and I'm going to wear the fruit on my head because I really think... Or maybe not. I try, but I can't get a word in edgewise. Dee Dee never stops yakking. I don't get it. When does she come up for air? By the time we reach the school, I've heard enough of the world according to Dee Dee to last a while. Like forever. We step into the lobby and... Well, well, well! Stand back, everybody! Here comes the hot new couple! Ugh. It's Randy Betancourt, PS38's resident scuzzball. He's just like Chad's tailbone. A total pain in the butt. Randy's good qualities. There aren't any. He snickers and shoots us one of his typical Randy smirks. Briefly, I consider hitting him in his big fat nose with a piece of fruit. After all, Dee Dee's got a head full of ammo. Then, we're not a couple, pea brain, Dee Dee tells him. We're just friends. But what would you know about that? You have no friends. The smirk slides off Randy's face in half a heartbeat. He looks totally stunned. Hey, I'm a little stunned myself. Did that just really happen? Wow, Dee Dee, I tell her. You just punked Randy Betancourt. She shrugs. He deserved it, she says as we hang up our coats. If two friends want to go to a dance together, why do some people make such a big deal out of it? I could remind Dee Dee that she can make a big deal out of sharpening a pencil, but I decide not to. I'm too busy breathing a huge sigh of relief. Did you hear what you just called us? Friends! So she doesn't like me. Not in that sort of way. I can relax. Dee Dee's not gonna turn all sappy and start calling me stupid pet names like Lamb Chomp, Dumpling Face, Puffy Bunny, Snuggle Bug, Honey Bee, Sugar Booger, Passion Panda. Nate! Hello? Nate! Dee Dee gets my attention. I'm going to change into my beach clothes, she says. Good idea. I grab my backpack and slip into the bathroom. I'm still feeling pretty pumped. Knowing Dee Dee isn't all gung-ho to make me her love monkey has flipped this whole evening completely around. Now I've got nothing to worry about. I take off my shoes and pants and shirt and... Hmm? Nab! Hey! Randy! He disappears. 
and all my clothes go with him. I look down at what I'm wearing, and a sick feeling settles in my gut. Tidy whities and a pair of tube socks won't cut it as beach attire. I peek out, hoping I'll spot a friendly face, and hoping nobody spots me. It would be just my luck to run into a reporter from the school newspaper right about now. I can already see the headline. Strawny sixth grader humiliated at dance! Click! The lobby's empty. Everybody's gone into the gym. Unless I want to stroll in there looking like an escapee from a nudist colony, I'm stuck. Or am I? Dee Dee. Psst. Dee Dee. Psst. She stops, then inches slowly toward me. Nate? She asks. What are you doing? I hesitate. This is pretty embarrassing. But what do I have to lose? We're friends, right? Dee Dee said so herself. And I need help. Uh, Randy took my clothes. <clears throat> All my clothes. She scowls. He's an even bigger moron than I thought he was, she grumbles. Then her face brightens. <gasps> I have an amazing idea, she says. Wait right here. Wait right here? That's hilarious. Where does she think I'd go? Dee Dee to the rescue! She says, returning. I brought an extra outfit, just in case. This must be some drama queen rule. Always be ready for a costume change. I don't know what's in that bag, but I'm not picky. It's got to be better than what I'm wearing. Three minutes later, I throw open the door. Wham! Ooh! Dee Dee beams. Bravo! Clappy clap, clap, clap. You look fabulous! Fabulous, I shout in disbelief. I'm wearing a dress. It's a grass skirt, genius, she says matter-of-factly as she drags me toward the gym. Grass schmass, I can't be seen in this. Oh, come on. Men in Hawaii wear them all the time. Great, Hawaii is 5,000 miles away and I look like an idiot. But why sweat the details? Into the gym we go with me praying that everyone's too busy dancing to notice me. But then, hey, look at Nate! A bunch of kids gather around. I brace myself. Here comes the abuse. That's cool, Nate. Really cool. Wait, what's going on here? No finger pointing? No insults? What's wrong with these people? That's amazing, Nate, someone says. You look just like them. I'm about to ask who them is, and then I look up at the stage. Sandy and the Surf Riders. I'm dressed exactly like the band, or they're dressed exactly like me. You must know those guys, right? One kid says. How'd you pull it off, Nate? Asks another. It, well, uh, I stammer. I can't think of a single word to say. But Dee Dee can. Some people just know how to make an entrance. And that's that. I get a few more compliments, and then everybody starts dancing again, leaving me and Dee Dee standing by the snack table. Hmm. Now what? I should probably say something to her, like, thanks for not being as annoying as I thought you'd be, or thanks for saving me from spending the rest of my life in the boys' bathroom. That's not what comes out, though. Instead, it's... So... Where'd you get this thing anyway? From the drama club, she says. Then she strikes a pose and gives a sigh so huge it practically blows my shirt off. <sighs> oh, I just love the drama club. Yes, Dee Dee, we know. Without the drama club, life would have no meaning. And without Dee Dee, the cartooning club still won't have any girls. Suddenly, I remember what I was doing when this whole thing started. Recruiting. Uh, listen, Dee Dee, um, do you want to join the doodlers? Little old me? I tell her about the club and what an awesome advisor Mr. Rosa is. I talk about the fun drawing games we play at meetings like add-on, connect the freckles, and going, going, Godfrey. And, I add, if you join, you'll be the first girl doodler ever. You'll be, ahem, 
a celebrity. Bing! I'm in, she announces immediately. Excellent, I say, and I mean it too. Sort of. Let's boogie, Dee Dee shouts, and she and I hit the dance floor. Whew! Except for the fact that my clothes are probably stuffed in a garbage can somewhere, this all turned out pretty well. I still think Dee Dee needs to hit the off button on the Dramatron, but she kept this dance from becoming a total disaster. She's okay. Do you feel something wet? She asks suddenly. Huh? Wet? That's weird. Maybe one of those tangerines on her head just sprang a leak. Plunk. Or maybe... It's starting to rain in here. Chapter 5 The Amazing Adventures of Ultranate Super Sixth Grader Today's episode, Rain Dance Co-starring, Dee Dee Ta-da! Hey! At the PS38 Beach Party Dance, our hero has just made a shocking discovery. It's raining, but how? We're indoors. I'll use my ultra vision to get to the bottom of this. Egad! This is a job for... Rip! For Ultranate! With cat-like reflexes, even though he hates cats, Ultranate reacts. Zow! Where is he going? What does he see? Our hero has spotted heavy snow on the roof. Too heavy. And the whole building is about to collapse. Crick, crick, rumble. Get out, everyone, now! Down below. Okay, kids, let's proceed in a nice, orderly... Run, run, or you'll die! As the panicked students rush for the exits... Yeah! Ultranate heroically holds up the roof. Ugh. Looks like all the kids got out safely. Now I'll let go of the ceiling and... Uh-oh, look who didn't escape. Oh, I, I twisted my ankle. I can't move. Oh, brother, leave it to Dee Dee to create some last-second drama. Boom! As the amazing Ultranate zooms toward Dee Dee at supersonic speed, the roof caves in. <laughs> Swoop, nab! He saved Dee Dee. What an incredible rescue. I'm... I'm speechless. Great. That's an added bonus. And now, pineapple for everybody. Yay! Hooray for Ultranate! The end. Okay, it might not have happened exactly like that. I was using a little something we cartoonists call artistic license. So sue me. But it did start raining inside the gym, and I did come to Dee Dee's rescue. Sort of. Here's the real story. The chaperones didn't even notice the rain at first. They were too busy stuffing their faces at the snack table. But then the fire alarm went off. That made them step away from the bean dip. Ding, ding, urk. Ding, ding, spoosh. Ding, ding, ptool. But there wasn't a fire. And the rain wasn't coming from a leaky roof either. After they'd hustled us out of the gym and into the lobby... Principal Nichols explained what was going on. Looks like the sprinkler system malfunctioned. There must be an electrical problem. Dee Dee looked crushed. Well, that isn't very dramatic, she grumbled. I'm afraid we'll have to end the dance a little early, Principal Nichols went on. Find your belongings and leave the building. Quickly, please. Then things got crazy. We were all looking for our stuff in a giant mosh pit. It was still raining, the fire alarm was still ringing, and Coach John was marching around like a deranged drill sergeant. Hup, hup, move, urchins, move! Once I stepped outside, brrrr, it was like walking into a giant snow globe. Don't get me wrong, I love snow, but ever wear a grass skirt in a blizzard? My butt felt like a frozen popsicle. Come on, Francis says. We're going over to Teddy's house for hot cocoa. With marshmallows, Teddy adds. Mmm, marshmallows, my favorite food group. 
I started to follow the guys, but then... Nate! Dee Dee says. My boots are gone! Uh, maybe they'll show up in the Lost and Found on Monday, I told her. Translation, life happens, Dee Dee. Deal with it. But what about now? She wailed. I can't walk home in the snow wearing sandals. My toes will get frostbite. Clearly her mouth wasn't getting frostbite. But I had to admit, I did sort of owe her one. If it wasn't for Dee Dee, I would have had to evacuate the building in my underwear. <sighs> Hop on. Ooh, yay! Talk about a lousy end to a lousy night. Not only did I carry Dee Dee home on my back, I had to listen to her reenact scenes from her favorite horse movies. <laughs> Gallop, Black Beauty! Gallop! At home in bed, I made a note to self. Never! Not even by accident, invite a girl to a dance again. Unless it's Jenny. Arr. Hmm? I see a blinking light flash from Francis's window. That's our secret signal. I grab my binoculars and peer through the snow across the yard. Francis holds a sign. Cluffy's tomorrow morning. Yes! Tomorrow can't get here fast enough. At exactly ten o'clock the next morning, Francis and I are standing at the base of Cluffy's Cliff. It's not really a cliff, I guess, but it's the steepest hill in town. It's perfect for sledding. I wonder where Teddy is, I say. Francis's eyes widen as he looks behind me. Wow, he shouts. Teddy! A super snow tube, I say. Dude, where'd you get that? Bought it myself, Teddy answers proudly. I saved the money I made shoveling driveways. Now I'm really stoked about taking on Cluffy's Cliff. We hike up to the top, and after going on a couple runs himself, Teddy lets Francis and me have a turn. It's amazing! That's way faster than a plain old snow saucer! I whoop after my first ride. I wonder what the speed record is for snow tubes, Francis says. Go look it up, geek, says a gruff voice. Meanwhile, we'll borrow your new toy. It's Nolan, the kid who ambushed us the other day, and it looks like he's got half the Jefferson wrestling team with him. We're using it right now, Teddy tells him. Aw, oh, come on, Nolan says in a fake, you just hurt my feelings voice. Be nice, boom. He snatches it right out of Teddy's hands. Then he and his crew pile on top of it. Hop on, boys, Nolan says. And they do. <laughs> Ow, you're crushing me! Hey, get off, Teddy shouts. It can only hold two people. Relax, weenie, Nolan says. It's just a test drive. Shoosh! They push off down the hill, but they don't get far. They catch air going over the first bump and... Woohoo! Wham! Hiss! Disaster! By the time the three of us reach the tube, it's flat as a pancake, and Nolan and his gang are walking away. Bad news, chump! He calls. Looks like playtime is over! <laughs> it's a helpless feeling. What are we going to do? Try and fight them? Those guys are huge. They'd give us the worst face wash we ever had. Teddy's about to cry, and I don't blame him. I only got to ride it twice, he says miserably. Let's take it back to my house, I say. We can try to patch it. But we can all see it's beyond patching. We trudge along in silence until... Hey, I say. What's going on at the school? A bunch of vans and trucks are lined up in front of PS38 like it's afternoon carpool time. What's with all the action on a Saturday? That's Dee Dee's dad, Francis says, pointing to a beefy guy on the sidewalk. Mr. Holloway, are you fixing the sprinkler system? Eventually, he says. But first we gotta clean up. It's a mess in there. There's water damage, cracked plaster, mold... You want to clean up the mold? Easy, shut down the hot lunch program. Francis looks puzzled. 
But how can we have school with all that going on? He asks. Dee Dee's dad shrugs. You can't, he says. PS 38 is gonna be closed for a while. Chapter 6 Welcome to the happiest day of my life. Dad, I say. Great news! PS 38 is closing! Yes, I know. Dad says as Teddy, Francis, and I peel off our snow gear. I just read an email from your principal. It explains the sprinkler malfunction, the cleanup effort, the timetable for reopening. Does it also explain my master plan for Monday morning? I ask. I'm going to wake up early, go stand in the driveway, and wave at the Jefferson bus as it rolls by. Have fun at school, kids. Study hard. Yuck, yuck. Dad shoots me an odd little smile. Speaking of Jefferson, he begins. I groan. Ugh, can we not talk about Jefferson, Dad? That whole school is jerk central. He raises an eyebrow. Really? He asks. Then he shrugs. All right, I won't say another word, but you boys might want to take a look at that email. Huh? Why, so we can read Principal Nichols' thrilling description of Mildew in the teacher's lounge? No, thanks. We've got better things to do, like making plans for our bonus vacation. Woohoo! Teddy and I celebrate. Hold it, Francis says, looking at Dad's laptop. You could forget about that vacation, he says. Listen to this. During the restoration of PS38, no class time will be missed. Our top priority is to make certain that teaching and learning continue without interruption. What? Teddy and I cry in unison. In other words, we still have to go to school, Francis says. Where? In an igloo? Teddy asks. Francis keeps reading. For the next two weeks, classes will be held on the campus of our sister institution, Jefferson Middle School. No! The three of us wail. It can't be true. This is an outrage! But then Francis and Teddy call home, and guess what? Their parents got the exact same email. What a punch in the gut. Gloom. I feel flatter than Teddy's snow tube. Going to another school for two weeks is lousy enough. But Jefferson? They already think we're pathetic. This pretty much proves it. You know why these losers have to come to our school? There sprang a leak. <laughs> I'm taking off, Teddy mutters. I'm too bummed out to have any fun. Same here, Francis says. I know what they mean. The day went bad faster than Dad's tuna casserole. I watch them leave, trudge upstairs to my room, and flop onto my bed. <sighs> I've been here before. And no, I don't mean in bed, duh. I mean I've been in a situation like this, where something that seemed great turned into a giant turd fest. Here's what happened. Nate's True Life Comics. Today's episode, A Moving Experience. One day last summer, Teddy and I were walking to the park when... Look, I said. A sold sign in front of Mrs. Godfrey's house. Mrs. Godfrey is moving, Teddy said. The next day, a big truck came. What an ugly couch. One of the movers said. We watched it load up and drive away. She's gone, I said. It's a miracle, Teddy exclaimed. It was a great summer. Wahoo, we shouted. We didn't even mind going back to school because... Guess who won't be here, I said. Nyuck, nyuck. But then... Mrs. Godfrey, we said in unison. Sit down and be quiet, she reprimanded. But, but, didn't you move? I asked. Yes, I moved to a new house, two blocks away from my old one. 
Maybe we should move, I said back at my desk. No talking! The end. My mood hasn't improved much by Monday morning as the guys and I take the long, slow walk toward Jefferson. School zone, a sign reads. Shouldn't that say school full of obnoxious pinhead zone? Teddy asks. Yoo-hoo! We turn to see Dee Dee running after us. Of course, who else would scream yoo-hoo at 7.30 on a Monday morning? Hi, gang! Isn't this exciting? Exciting? I repeat in disbelief. Oh, sure, says Teddy, with a what planet are you from eye roll. It'll be a thrill to get laughed at by Jefferson for two weeks. I won't mind that one bit, Dee Dee counters. When people laugh, it means they notice you. I'd rather not get noticed, thanks, I say. Or wedgied, Teddy says. Or stuffed in a locker, Francis chimes in. That shuts Dee Dee up for maybe two seconds. Then she drops this one on us. You guys are acting like such weenies. We stop dead in our tracks. The three of us stare at her, completely dumbstruck. Well, you are, she says. Why are you so afraid of Jefferson? We're not afraid of them, I shoot back. We're just sick of them winning all the time. Nobody wins all the time, she declares. I'll bet our drama club could outperform their drama club. Ooh, thanks, Dee Dee. The next time some Jefferson goons are throwing snowballs on my head, I'll remind them that they're no match for PS38 in the vitally important category of musical theater. Meanwhile, she's still babbling. All I'm saying is everyone can be beaten. Everyone has an Achilles heel. Okay, whatever that means. I don't really have time to think about it because... We're here. My jaw drops. Holy cow! This is a school? It looks more like a museum. There are glass cases everywhere, filled from top to bottom with piles of trophies. There are murals painted on the walls and mobiles hanging from the ceiling. There's even a skylight. And right in the middle of the lobby, on a huge pedestal, there's a knight. Sorry, a cavalier. They're always bragging that they've got a better mascot than we do. And they might be right. Compared to King Arthur here, the stuffed bobcat in the PS38 lobby looks like something we fished out of a dumpster. Welcome to Jefferson Middle School, booms a voice to our left. I'm the principal, Mrs. Williger, and I am so happy you're here. So are we, agrees Dee Dee, who's apparently elected herself our official spokesperson. There's still plenty of time before homeroom, Mrs. Williger tells us. Make yourselves at home. At home? Yeah, sure. This place is about as homey as the Grand Canyon. I can't believe how fancy it is, Francis says. Francis is right. The more we look around, the more there is to see. Jefferson Middle School. Fancy facts. Fact number one. The drinking fountains all have motion sensors. Just stick your nose here and it turns on. Fact number two. The auditorium has movie-style seats, and they recline. All that's missing is the popcorn. Fact number three. There's a rec room for kids to use during free periods. A ping-pong table. A vending machine with cheese doodles. This is quite a place, isn't it, kids? It's got everything. Principal Nichols, we all say. How come you're here? Teddy asks him. I thought you were fixing up our school. He chuckles. <laughs> I'll leave that to people who know what they're doing, like Dee Dee's father. Our place is with our students. After all, we're in this together. So the teachers from PS38 are here at Jefferson, too? Francis asks. Absolutely, he answers. Nuts. My chance for a two-week break for Mrs. Godfrey just got flushed. Right down one of Jefferson's gold-plated toilets. Would you like to see something else? Principal Nichols asks. Okay, Dee Dee says. Uh-huh, Teddy chimes in. Yeah, Francis calls out. Sure, bring it on, big fella. Considering how swanky this school is, there's probably a hot tub in the science lab. 
Principal Nichols leads us through a maze of hallways and down a flight of stairs. Almost there, he says cheerfully as he pushes open a metal door. But hold on. What's with the sign that says, Exit? This is it, Principal Nichols announces. Your new homeroom. Chapter 7 We stand at the back door of Jefferson, staring out at... Um... Okay, I have no clue. What are those things? Is this a trailer park? I ask. They're modular classrooms, Nate, Principal Nichols explains. Jefferson used them last fall when they renovated their seventh grade wing, and fortunately for us, they're still here. Fortunately for us? Is he serious? What's fortunate about going to class in a giant shoebox? Think of it as a grand adventure, he tells us. It'll be like going to camp. Uh, no, it won't. Not unless your camp's in the middle of a parking lot. But obviously Principal Nichols has to say that. Making lousy stuff sound good is one of those things all grown-ups do. Here, Nate, drink this delicious smoothie. It tastes just like a milkshake. Beet juice, broccoli, clams. A pop quiz is a wonderful opportunity to improve your grade point average. Plus, it's fun to watch you panic. A few weeks of wind sprints and you'll be as well-conditioned as Olympic athletes. Faint. Gasp. Oop. Principal Nichols steers us toward one of the boxes. You're in room F. Hear that, Nate? Teddy cracks. <laughs> room F. That matches our social studies grade. We swing open the door, and there's Mrs. Godfrey. At PS 38, she's always surrounded by books, maps, and other torture devices. Here, all she's got is a flimsy little desk. It feels different. Shut that door! Mrs. Godfrey bellows. You're letting in the cold air. Different, but exactly the same. Hmm, I grumble, looking around. The real classrooms are all tricked out with murals and posters and stuff, and we don't even get a window. Teddy nods. Yeah, the only thing to look at is... He points silently at Mrs. Godfrey. Not exactly a scenic view, I snicker. But look at the upside, guys, Francis chimes in. Since they've separated us from the Jefferson students, we won't have to listen to them rag on us all day. Hmm, that actually makes sense. As the classrooms fill up and the bell rings, it starts to feel like just another brain-frying, butt-numbing school day. By the end of third period, we've almost forgotten we're even at Jefferson. And then comes lunch. Lunch fact. All-time worst dessert in PS38 history, stewed prunes. Splut. Even a fancy-pants school like Jefferson has only one cafetorium, which means they have to share it with us. When the noon bell rings, we scurry away from our little boxcar village and into the main building. Excuse me, which way to the cafetorium? Francis asks some Jefferson kid. That way, he says. And it's not a cafetorium, it's a food court. Oh, brother, Teddy mumbles as we continue down the hall. Can this place get any more stuck up? Wonder what they call the bathrooms, Francis says. Freshness facilities? Sanitation stations? I joke. <laughs> we turn the corner and see a crowd of kids pouring into the cafeteria. No, I will not call it the food court. That's when it hits us. Something smells... good. That's weird. We're not used to anything smelling good in school, because frankly, PS38 is the stinkiest place on Earth. Rank the stank! PS38's worst odors! Coach John's pits, fists clenched above his head. Run! Run! Mrs. Godfrey's breath. And in your homework. Mr. Galvin's 40-year-old cologne. It really clears out my sinuses. Maria Spinaldi's mango papaya hair conditioner. Flip. The mysterious air vent in room 216. 
you look in there. No, you look in there! Holy cow, Teddy exclaims. Can you believe this menu? Deep dish pizza, barbecued chicken wings, Francis calls out. Cheesy garlic bread, sweet potato fries, Teddy says. Guys, look, I say. They've got a soft serve machine. We can't believe our eyes. There's not a stewed prune in sight. Okay, we don't have to like Jefferson, but we can like their food. What are we waiting for? Francis says. Let's eat! Guys, guys, Teddy says. Trouble. I spin around and spot Chad with his tailbone pillow, and look who's giving him the evil eye. Nolan. Teddy's right. This is trouble. Hey, lardball, Nolan sneers. You're not a PS38 anymore. You don't have to carry around your own toilet seat. <laughs> That's just wrong. Chad's the smallest kid in the sixth grade, and he's hurt. The last thing he needs is a scuzz bucket like Nolan piling on. Or maybe it's not a toilet seat, Nolan laughs. Maybe it's a frisbee. Nab. He grabs it away from Chad. Dudes, catch. Hey. Zing. I look for a teacher, but there aren't any. Typical. When you don't want them around, they're on you like white on rice. But when you actually need one, good luck. I feel my hands curl into fists. I'm no match for Nolan. But somebody's got to help Chad. So I guess it will have to be... Dee Dee. She marches over to Nolan and sticks her finger right in his chest. You give him back his pillow, she demands. Nolan does a quick 360 to make sure no teachers are watching. Then he slaps Dee Dee's hand away. Beat it, he growls. Dee Dee's gonna get herself killed, Francis says. I take a deep breath. Then we might as well all get killed, I say. Let's go, guys. We park ourselves next to Dee Dee and Chad. Come on, Nolan, Teddy says. Knock it off. Give us that thing. <laughs> Give it to you? He laughs right in Teddy's face. Why? He asks. Looking for a new snow tube? <laughs> Good one, Nolan. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So much for Dad's bully theory. When you look beneath the surface, Nate, bullies are cowards. If you stand up to them, they'll back down. Thanks for the wisdom, Dad. I'll file that away with all your other brilliant theories like making your bed every day helps you live longer, and if you really get to know her, Mrs. Godfrey is probably a very nice person. Give it here, Dee Dee says suddenly, trying to snatch the pillow from Nolan, but he's too quick for her. Ha! <laughs> He says, I don't think so. He tosses it toward one of his crew, but it veers the tiniest bit off target. I can catch it, if I can just get up high enough. Nab! Got it! Yep! By the time I realize I'm losing my balance, it's too late. I'm going backward off a table. Look out below! Womp! Oof! I lie there, stunned, hoping I didn't just join Chad in the bruised tailbone club. Good gravy! Nate, are you all right? It's Principal Nichols. Great timing. Now he shows up? Mrs. Williger is here, too. But she doesn't look quite as friendly as she did this morning. At Jefferson, she says, we don't tolerate horseplay. Horseplay? I protest. But I wasn't. We'll sort it out later, Nate, Principal Nichols tells me. Let's get you up on your feet. Ow, 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 ow. What hurts? He asks. My wrist, I groan. I try to flex it, and the pain hits about a 50 on a scale of 1 to 10. Is he going to live? Asks Dee Dee. I think you'll make it, says Principal Nichols, lifting me off the floor. With a little help from his supporting cast. Chapter 8 Supporting cast, I say, tapping the hardened plaster around my arm. Get it? You know, that's not a bad joke.
Teddy says as we file into the art room the next morning. For a principal. Joke smoke, I grumble. What's funny about a broken wrist? Francis chimes in. Well, the fact that you broke it while catching an inflatable butt pillow is pretty amusing. <laughs> oh, sure, Francis. It's a riot. And having a hunk of plaster wrapped around my hand for the next month should be a barrel of laughs. I used to think it might be kind of cool to have a cast. Last year, when Eric Fleury broke his arm, everyone treated him like Joe Celebrity. All the girls were lining up for Eric time. Did it hurt, Eric? It must have hurt. I can't believe you didn't cry. Suddenly, the guy was a total babe magnet. And P.S., all he did was fall down in the schoolyard while doing cheesy kung fu moves. At least I got hurt trying to help Chad. Anyway, Eric's moment of glory lasted about three minutes. After that, he said having a cast turned into a major pain. And boy, was he right. This thing is hot. It itches like crazy. And it's already starting to smell like Coach John's tube socks. <sighs> but you know the worst part about it? It's on my right hand. My drawing hand. Okay, gang, Mr. Rosa says. All we have are pencils and paper. Hmm. <laughs> so guess what we're gonna do today? Oh, Chad says. Draw? Brilliant deduction, Chad. There's only one little problem. I can't draw. Ah! Oh, I've tried. It's the first thing I did when I got home from the hospital yesterday. But I can't even hold a pencil with this stupid cast on. It's like wearing a cement mitten. So then I went with plan B. Drawing left-handed. Alternate. Never fear. Nate is here. Pathetic, right? I did better drawings back in kindergarten. And Dad made it worse by doing that fake praise thing parents always do. I hate that. That's good, Nate. That's really, uh, good. So now you know why I'm not exactly turning cartwheels when Mr. Rosa tells us to get to work. But I give it a shot. Pencil held between toes. Swick, 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 swick. Pencil used like an ice pick. Poink, 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 poink. Pencil held in mouth. Maybe you should try sticking the pencil up your nose, Teddy cracks, after watching me draw a dog that looks more like a radioactive spider. Woof! Maybe you should, I snap back. I don't have a broken wrist, he reminds me. That could change, I threaten. Okay, everyone, five-minute warning, Mr. Rosa calls out. As we all start cleaning up, he stops by our table. Do you kids remember Mrs. Everett, he asks. Sure, says Francis. She came to our doodlers meeting. Well, Mr. Rosa continues. Her club, the CIC, is meeting today. And we're invited. Ooh, lucky us. When science ends, and not a moment too soon, because Mr. Galvin was about to hit a new low on the charisma meter, the doodlers head for Mrs. Everett's room, along with our newest member. This is so exciting. I've never been to a cartooning club meeting. What do you think it'll be like? I can't wait to see everyone's comics. Have you ever met any famous cartoonists? What if I become a famous cartoonist someday? Dee Dee's yapping like a chihuahua on a sugar buzz. I guess she's all amped up about listening to the almighty CIC tell us how talented they are. Or maybe she can't wait to see one of my amazingly lame left-handed drawings. Hey, gang, want to watch me draw some wobbly lines? I think we're here, Francis says. It seems pretty quiet, Teddy says as we approach an open doorway. Are you sure we're in the right place? You're absolutely in the right place, says Mrs. Everett, waving us into the room. CIC is secret code. It means, come in, cartoonists. Here's a shocker. Jefferson has the swankiest art studio I've ever seen. And it's packed with kids drawing comics. Hey, everyone, Mrs. Everett says. 
These are the members of the PS38 cartooning club. A few look up and nod, but most of them don't even notice us. They just keep drawing. Wow. It's like an assembly line in here. They seem very... Uh... Francis finishes for me. Focused? Yes, Mrs. Everett nods. They have a deadline. The story spinner entries are due in three days. Excuse, please, Artur asks. What is Story Spinner? It's a local literary magazine, Mrs. Everett explains. It's sponsoring a kid's writing contest. Chad looks baffled. But comics aren't writing. Sure they are, she says. They're writing combined with pictures, and the contest rules clearly state, Comics welcome. I have entry forms if you're interested. She adds. Woo! I sure am, Chad says. I'm interested, intrigued, and inspired, Francis put in. Yes, what he said, says Artur. I'll be right back, Mrs. Everett smiles. Everybody chatters excitedly as she goes to her desk. Except me. I don't say a word. What's wrong with this picture? Teddy asks. Huh? I mumble. Dude, you're quieter than some of these CIC stiffs, Teddy says. Why so bummed out? Because I can't enter the contest, Einstein, I answer. I'm halfway through my most hilarious Dr. Cesspool adventure ever, but until I get this dumb cast off, scritch, 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 I can't finish it. Mrs. Everett is back. Why not collaborate, she suggests. You could write the rest of the story, and couldn't one of your fellow doodlers supply the artwork? Yes! Dee Dee exclaims. One of us could! Me, 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 me! What? Whoa, whoa! No offense, Dee Dee, but you're not exactly at the top of my A-list. I'll team up with Francis, or Teddy, or... I think that's a great idea! Mr. Rosa just appeared out of nowhere at our table. It'll be like Dee Dee's Doodler's Initiation. Oh, come on. I already took her to the dance and carried her home on my back. Haven't I suffered enough? But Mr. Rose is wearing his happy advisor face. Nuts. I guess it's settled. Here are your entry forms, Mrs. Everett says. Just hand them back by Friday, along with your comics. Dee Dee scoots her chair over next to mine. Tell me about Dr. Cesspool. What's his story? Uh, his story? Is he married? Does he have kids? What's his middle name? His favorite color? You see, in the drama club, we really get to know our characters. Yeah, but this isn't the drama club, I hiss at her. It's, it's... My voice trails off. What's the matter? She whispers. I look around the room at all the Jefferson kids bent over their drawings. It's just so dead in here. I'm not used to this. Doodler's meetings are fun. Mr. Rosa lets us talk and play the radio and eat snacks. This is different. This is like school. You're right, Nate. It is awfully quiet, Mr. Rosa says. Then he gives me a wink. But maybe the doodlers can find a way to liven things up. He walks over to Mrs. Everett. May we show you and your students a fun drawing game? Of course, she answers. Grab a fresh sheet of paper, everyone, Mr. Rosa announces. We're going to play add-on. Add-on? Huh? What's that? Never heard of it. Do we have to? You'll figure it out as we go along, Mr. Rosa tells them. At the end of the game, you'll have drawn a complete character from head to toe. Except the characters might not have heads, Chad laughs. Or toes! I'll go first, I say. Draw, um, a big nose covered with warts. And that's all you draw, Mr. Rosa says. Until the next person tells us what to add on. How about it, Teddy? Let's add on a peg leg. Ah, Mr. Rosa exclaims. So now it's up to you, cartoonists, to decide exactly where to draw that peg leg. 
One Jefferson kid looks confused. My drawing is just a nose and a peg leg floating in space. Perfect! You're doing it right, says Mr. Rosa. Who's next? Um, a sombrero? A handlebar mustache? A robotic arm? Big buggy eyes? A duck foot? A missing tooth? A tail? Elephant ears? A long neck? Like I always say, there's nothing like a game of add-on to break the ice. When the time comes for everyone to show off their drawings, we're all cracking up. Every single drawing is completely hilarious. And believe it or not, guess whose is my favorite? It was signed F for funny, A for amazing, B for brilliant, U for unpredictable, L for lively, O for original, U for upbeat, S for stylish, the F-A-B-U-L-O-U-S, fabulous Dee Dee. That was fabulous. Dee Dee says as we leave Mrs. Everett's room an hour later. I should have joined the Doodlers years ago. We didn't exist years ago, Francis points out. It was a good meeting, I say, once those CIC kids actually started talking to us. Yeah, some of them were pretty nice, Dee Dee agrees. See you guys. Jefferson isn't so bad after all. Chapter 9 Ahem, <laughs> um, hi. Wowza. A girl is walking. No, wait, let me start again. A turbo cute girl is walking this way, and she's looking right at me. Jackpot! You're Nate, right? She asks. I'm Nate, right? I mean, Nate, right? I'm Nate, right? Right. <laughs> Very smooth, Teddy mutters. I give him a quick kick in the shin. I just want to tell you, the mystery girl says. Everyone thought it was great the way you stood up to Nolan in the food court yesterday. Oh, that? <laughs> I do stuff like that all the time. You do? <sighs> Can I sign your cast? So this is what it was like for Eric Fleury. Sure, I say. I think I've got a pen here somewhere. Oh, I've got one, she says quickly, pulling out a marker the size of a salami. Well then, sign away. Oh, I will. Happy reading. <laughs> Wait, what? She disappears around the corner, and I hear an explosion of laughter. A vice tightens in my stomach as I look down at my wrist. P.S. 38 stinks. Then she's back. Only this time she's not alone. Can I sign your cast too? Says a girl. Don't bother, Emma. I already said it all. <laughs> Away they go, laughing their heads off. Bet you a buck they're not discussing knock-knock jokes. That was a tricky dirt, Artur says. You mean dirty trick says Francis. And yeah, it sure was. Jefferson isn't so bad after all, I say to Dee Dee. Ha! Dee Dee throws up her hands. Don't blame me, she protests. I was just trying to look on the bright side. There is no bright side, Chad sighs. Not until we prove we can beat them at something. What about the game on Saturday? Teddy asks. What about it? I'll be watching from the bench. I can't play basketball with this giant plaster sweatband on my wrist. Wait, won't the game be postponed? Francis asks. The gym at PS38 is in no condition to... Teddy cuts him off. We're not playing at PS38. They're moving the game here, to Jefferson. But that makes it a home game for them, I say. That's not fair. Oh, no! Dee Dee swoons. How will we cope? Now what? Is this another example of Dee Dee's terminal case of look at me itis or. Are you mocking me? No, she says, hands on her hips. I'm simply pointing out how useless it is to stand around complaining when you could be figuring out how to win the game. She points to a poster. 
Boys basketball, Saturday, 7 p.m. Jefferson versus PS38, crush the cats. Apparently, while I wasn't paying attention, Dee Dee became a basketball expert. Okay, then, coach, I say sarcastically. How do we win? By finding Jefferson's weakness, of course. Finding their weakness. Jeepers, why didn't I think of that? It's so simple. I never said it was simple, she tells me. But Jefferson's not indestructible. They've got to have an Achilles heel. That's the second time she said that. Who's this Achilles dude? And what does his heel have to do with anything? Later at home, I decide to find out. Dad, I ask, what's an Achilles heel? Well, it's... Ooh, says Ellen, my sister. I'll show you. Wait one sec. Who asked you, Ellen? But before I can stop her, she's shoving some papers in my face. I wrote this report in fourth grade, she brags. Difference number 7,387,289 between me and Ellen. The reports I did in fourth grade are buried in a landfill somewhere. The ones she did are carefully stored in a file cabinet in her room right next to her priceless collection of plastic panda figurines. Read and learn, she says. The Myth of Achilles, A+, plus, by Ellen Wright, grade four. In ancient Greece, the goddess Thetis fell in love with a mortal named Peleus. They had a son and named him Achilles. When Achilles was a baby, Thetis decided that she wanted Achilles to be immortal like she was. So she carried him to the river Styx. Everything that touched the river's magical waters became indestructible. Thetis held Achilles by the heel and dipped him in the river, not realizing that his heel never touched the waters. Achilles grew up and became the greatest warrior in the land. The Trojan War was being fought between Greece and Troy. Achilles was on the side of the Greeks. At first, Achilles refused to fight because he was mad at Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek army. But after his best friend Patroclus was killed, Achilles joined the battle. Thousands and thousands of Trojan arrows struck Achilles, but they had no effect. Then, one arrow hit him in the heel, the only part of his body left untouched by the protective waters of the river Styx. Because of that, Achilles died. So when people say something is your Achilles heel, they mean it's a tiny weakness that might cause you big trouble. I think that's interesting. Don't you? The end. Huh. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. But why should I tell her that? It's not my job to inflate Ellen's ego. She's got her own built-in pump. How did such a boring report get an A+. Plus? Give it back, Snatch. Ding dong. There's the doorbell. I'll get it. What the? Until this very second, I thought Dee Dee was a little unusual. Okay, maybe more than a little, but basically harmless. Now I'm not so sure. She might have some deeper issues. Rawr! Why are you dressed like a cat? I ask her. I could have said, have you completely lost your mind? I'm doing a dress rehearsal. She answers happily. And I'm not just any cat. I'm the PS38 Bobcat. <laughs> I'm going to wear this to the game Saturday and cheer us on to victory. I'll be our mascot. Are you crazy? I shout. You can't show up at Jefferson looking like that. Well, of course not, silly, she says. On game night, I'll be wearing makeup and whiskers. Our bobcats are fierce, I tell her. You look like you should be rolling around on the floor with a ball of yarn. Oh, pshaw, she says. Pshaw? Let's talk about our cartooning collaboration, she says. If I'm going to finish your Dr. Cesspool story in time to enter the contest, I'd better get started. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Dee Dee's imitation of a giant fur ball gave me a brain cramp. I grab a bunch of paper from my room but I don't like this. What if Dee Dee totally messes up my comic? What if she makes it all, well, Dee Dee-ish? Like, the first part's all done, and the second part I sketched lightly in pencil. So all you have to do is finish it in pen. You don't have to, uh, add any weird details or, I mean, just don't do any, anything. Um, you know, any changes or, uh, 
What I mean is, Nate, relax, she says. I'm not going to ruin your comic. Dr. Cesspool is in good hands. I mean, good pause. So, what happens? Two days later, Dee Dee submits Dr. Cesspool without even showing me the finished comic. I didn't have time to show it to you, she explains at the end of school on Friday. I finished it during lunch, and then I had to give it to Mrs. Everett right away or we would have missed the deadline. It's not that I don't believe her. It's just that I wanted to see it first. After all, Dr. Cesspool is my creation. But what's done is done. I can't do anything. Psst. Guys, in here, whispers a voice. Chad, Dee Dee says. Is that you? Yeah. He whispers back, Come on in, check out this cool room I found. Dee Dee and I squeeze inside. Close the doors, you guys, says Chad. I don't think we're supposed to be in here. Hey, this is pretty cool, I say. It's basically a king-size closet, packed with all sorts of stuff. Old science equipment that looks like its last stop was Frankenstein's lab. A couple of antique bicycles. A lawnmower, a stuffed owl. Ooh, Dee Dee says. A suit of armor. Another one, I say. They've already got one on display in the front hall. Yeah, Chad says. Why do they need two? Because they're twice as good as everyone else, I grumble. They're Jefferson. Achoo! Uh, it's too dusty in here, says Dee Dee. What are you doing in here, Chad? I ask. Hiding, he answers. Hiding? I ask as I pop back into the hallway. Hiding from who? Well, 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 Nolan jeers. There you are, tiny, he sneers at Chad. Playing a game of hide and seek with your little friends? We weren't playing any games, I say through gritted teeth. Oh, that's right, I forgot, Nolan crows. PS38 stinks at games, especially basketball. I guess we'll find out tomorrow, won't we, Dee Dee says. The only thing you'll find out is that a bobcat is no match for a cavalier, Nolan says. Good luck tomorrow, scrubs. You'll need it. Chapter 10 You can't always believe everything you see. Like this scoreboard, for instance. Home of the Cavaliers, Jefferson, 29, Visitors, 43, Time, 0, Quarter, 4. You're probably thinking, wow, PS38 did it. They beat Jefferson 43 to 29. Uh, wrong. See, the scoreboard only has room for two-digit numbers. We scored 43, all right, but Jefferson didn't score 29. They scored 129 points. What a butt-kicking. And all I could do was sit there and watch it. I felt like running onto the court and clubbing somebody over the head with my cast, but I stopped myself. I didn't want to re-break my wrist. Chad was on the bench beside me, taking pictures for the yearbook. Great, we can stick those on a page called Most Humiliating Moments. Poor coach. He's usually Peter Positive, but he looked like he just lost A, his dog, B, his best friend, and C, a basketball game, by 86 points. Maybe we can learn something from this experience, Bobcats. Something like, uh, um, oh, forget it. Nobody says much as we slog home after the game. Except Francis. Every time we lose to Jefferson, he has to analyze exactly what went wrong. Offense, defense, rebounding, he says. They beat us at every part of the game. Not every part, Dee Dee says. We clearly won the battle of the mascots. But they didn't have a mascot, Chad says. Exactly, answers Dee Dee. So I won. That's ridiculous, Francis says. There was no battle of the mascots. You just made up a competition. Made up a... Guys, I shout. 
Let's do it! Do what? Everyone asks. Make up our own competition! Ooh! Dee Dee exclaims. And then beat Jefferson at it! Right! I say. They've spanked us at all the official activities, so let's try an unofficial one. Francis is skeptical. Like what? Leave that to me, I tell him. I'll give it the great brain treatment. Have you ever read the great brain books? They're awesome. The main character, Tom, is a genius, like me. And whenever he has a problem that needs solving, he thinks about it right before he goes to bed. Then his great brain comes up with a perfect solution while he sleeps. When he wakes up in the morning, he's got an answer. I change into pajamas, brush my teeth, and get into bed, knowing that if my great brain does its job, in a few hours, I'll know exactly how to beat Jefferson. Except it doesn't work. When I open my eyes at 8 a.m., all I can remember is that I was having a dream about Mrs. Godfrey drowning in an ocean of cheese doodles but no great ideas, no perfect solutions. I guess my brain took the night off. And the morning, too. The hours roll by and I'm still stumped. Think, think, think! I haven't felt this clueless since that last science test. Who cares about the digestive system of a fruit fly? Anyway, I need help. And I know just who to ask. Someone with experience. Someone who knows what he's talking about. Hey, Dad? Hmm? He says, reading a newspaper. I'm going over to Mr. Rosa's. Okay. Mr. Rosa will understand. After all, he's been teaching at PS38 since before I was born. He's probably sick of losing to Jefferson, too. Well, hi, Nate. What can I do for you? I cut right to the chase. We want to challenge Jefferson to, um, something. Hmm, he says, inviting me in. What kind of something? That's what I can't figure out, I admit. Some kind of competition, but they're so good at everything. Well, nobody's good at everything, he says. And don't sell PS38 short, remember. You have strengths, too. Right. Uh, what do you mean, exactly? Think of that CIC meeting we went to the other day, he explains. Didn't you think it was kind of boring? Oh, yeah, it was a no-fun zone in there, I agree. Until we showed them how to play add-on. Right. By the way, who taught you that game? Nobody did. Teddy and I invented it one day in science. Uh, after we'd finished our lab report, of course. <laughs> Mr. Rosa smiles. I see, he says. Very creative. Then he pulls two booklets out of a drawer and lays them on the kitchen table. You might recognize one of these, he tells me. Hey, I say. It's the comic book I made. Nate's Comics Crack Up. It sure is, he says. And the other is a collection of drawings by the Jefferson CIC. Take a look. Wow. I get that familiar queasy feeling in my stomach as I flip through the booklet. They can really draw, is all I can say. Oh, yes, they're very good, Mr. Rosa agrees. But what I really like are the great stories. Huh? There are no stories in here, I say, scanning the booklet again. Just drawings. Right, he says, but your booklet is full of stories. Some very funny stories, by the way. Of course they're funny. They're Nate Wright originals. Alternate Dr. Cesspool, momentum. I repeat, Mr. Rosa says, his eyes twinkling. Very creative. Yeah, but I still don't know what kind of competition to have with Jefferson, I say as Mr. Rosa shows me to the door. You'll think of something, he says simply. Just remember your strengths. Strengths. Okay, I get the message. I'm creative. But how's that going to help us beat Jefferson in any kind of showdown? Hey. I spot a snowman in someone's front yard. Hey. It's not going to be a showdown. It's going to be a snowdown. That's it. I take off running. Maybe I didn't find an answer in my sleep like the great brain, but I figured something out eventually. It just goes to show, you can't rush genius. Wham! 
I slam into Dee Dee, who for some reason is standing right in the middle of the sidewalk. Oh, my leg, she moans as she gets to her feet. I think I fractured my kneecap. Save the drama for your mama, Dee Dee, I say, and listen to this great idea. Her face lights up as I describe my plan, and pretty soon she's hopping around like Spitzy with a kibble buzz. So much for that fractured kneecap. Come on, she says. Let's go to my house. We need to make this official. When we get to Dee Dee's, she pulls out some poster board and markers and gets to work. I call the guys to fill them in. We all agree. This is our best chance ever to finally beat Jefferson. They won't know what hit him, I say. First thing Monday morning, we do a little decorating in the Jefferson lobby. Hey, Nolan says. What's this? A challenge to Jefferson 6th grade from PS 38 6th grade. Think you can beat us in the ultimate snowdown? It's a snow sculpture contest. Show us what you've got. Fear the bobcat. Roar! Saturday on the soccer field. Be there. You're challenging us to a snow sculpture contest? Nolan sneers. Surprise, Teddy whispers in my ear. He can read. Haven't you dorks lost enough already? Nolan says. We're not planning on losing, Dee Dee answers. One of Nolan's groupies shoots us a suspicious look. How do we decide who wins? We can help with that, Mr. Rosa says, stepping forward. And Mrs. Everett chimes in too. Who better than a couple of art teachers to judge a sculpture contest? One judge from each school. That's fair, Francis says. Nolan shrugs. Whatever. It's not going to matter who the judges are because we're going to bury you. Yeah, says another Jefferson student. Prepare for an avalanche. And still another. Better bring a snowplow. They walk off, leaving us standing in the ginormous lobby full of trophies, plaques, and championship banners. Chad looks worried. They seem pretty confident. Yeah, I say but not as confident as I am. I think I found their Achilles heel. Chapter 11 The school is buzzing all week until, finally, Saturday's here. The air is cold, but not too cold. The snow's wet, but not too wet. It's perfect sculpture weather. And snowball weather. Let the ultimate snowdown begin, Mr. Rosa calls out. Ready, set, go! All of us swing into action. By us, I mean us kids. The ultimate snowdown is for kids only. We don't want a bunch of grown-ups trying to hog the glory. You know what happens when so-called adults try to take over. Traumatic flashback! Dad helps me build my car for the Timber Scout Driftwood Derby. Oops, he says, trying to handle the electric drill. Uh, how do you feel about a sunroof? Besides, it's not like we need any more people. We've got tons of kids ready to roll, and so does Jefferson. At least, I think they do. It's hard to tell because... Hey, look, Chad says. They're hanging a tarp, I say. What's that all about? Teddy asks. Maybe they think we'll try to copy their sculpture, Francis says. <laughs> As if, Teddy says. Or maybe they've got something to hide. See? Noland and another kid sneak out from behind the school, pulling a sled loaded up with... Well, whatever it is, it's all covered in blankets. We watch as they disappear behind the tarp. I wonder what that was, Chad says. Maybe it was a dead body, Dee Dee whispers. Right, Dee Dee. Teddy says, because a dead body comes in so handy during a snow sculpture contest. Guys, Francis says, come on, if we stand around yakking about what Jefferson's doing, we'll never finish our sculpture. Reality check. We've only got six hours. If we want to create a masterpiece by three o'clock this afternoon, we need to make every second count. So we do. Once we stop worrying about that giant tarp, we start humming along like a well-oiled machine. Some kids toss snow on the pile, others pack it down, and those of us with actual artistic talent do the rest. 
our sculpture starts to take shape. And I'm not just saying this because it was my idea. It looks awesome. I think it'll be good enough if my theory about Jefferson's weak spot is right. But we're not going to find out for sure until... It's three o'clock, says Mrs. Everett. Time for the judging. Let's start with Jefferson's entry, Mr. Rosa says. Cavaliers, unveil your sculpture. A couple of kids from the CIC start to lower the tarp. I hold my breath. This is it. Almighty Jefferson's moment of truth. It's Jefferson Cavalier, Nolan announces. Yay! The cheers from Jefferson almost blow my ears off. Our side looks stunned. There's no doubt. It's a pretty amazing sculpture. It's so incredibly lifelike, Francis says. It's just like the Cavalier in the lobby, Chad says. We're doomed, Dee Dee says. Doomed! Hmm. I'm not looking at the Cavalier. I'm looking at Mr. Rosa and Mrs. Everett. And you know what? I think they see what I see. The two of them inspect the sculpture from every angle. Then they put their heads together, talking in whispers. Finally, wipe, wipe. Clang, clang. There's a real suit of armor under here, Mr. Rosa says. It gets deadly quiet. I sneak a peek at Nolan. He looks nervous. That explains the impressive degree of realism, Mrs. Everett says. She turns to Nolan. Did you use the old suit of armor from the storage room? Well, yeah, but... So what if I did? There's no rule saying we couldn't. She nods. That's true. Technically, no rules were broken. But just covering something with snow instead of sculpting it yourselves... Well, it's not the most imaginative approach. I knew it, I whisper. Chad looks puzzled. You knew they were going to swipe that suit of armor? I shake my head. No, but I knew they're not as creative as we are. That's their Achilles heel. Shall we look at PS38's creation? Mrs. Everett says. We wade through the snow toward our sculpture. Mr. Rosa taps me on the shoulder. Nate? Tell us about PS 38's entry. Sure, I answer. It's called Achilles Gets the Point. Everyone looks at our snow sculpture of Achilles. What a dynamic pose, Mrs. Everett exclaims. And I love the expression on his face. How did you make the arrow? Mr. Rosa asks, glancing at the Jefferson kids. Did you pack snow around a real arrow? No. It's an icicle, I said. We pulled it off the roof of my garage. Mrs. Everett studies the blotch of red on Achilles' heel. This isn't actual blood, I hope. It's nail polish, Dee Dee says. I was trying to punch up the drama. Well, you succeeded, Mrs. Everett laughs. Then she nods at Mr. Rosa. He nods back. Here it comes. The judges are in agreement, she announces. The winners of the ultimate snowdown are the PS38 Bobcats. We explode. Everyone goes crazy. I mean crazy. Teddy's throwing handfuls of snow. Chad's doing snow angels. And Dee Dee's hugging anything that moves. Me? I just keep pinching myself. We finally did it. We beat Jefferson. Mrs. Everett finds me in the crowd. Nate, congratulations. You and your classmates did a wonderful job. Thanks, I say, ducking out of the way of a bear hug from Dee Dee. I'm curious, though, she says. Why did you choose Achilles as a subject? We just think it's a good story, I tell her. Achilles thought he was indestructible. But the truth is, anybody can be beaten. Chapter 12 P.S. 38 finally reopened on Monday. I never thought I'd say this, but I actually missed this dump. Me too, Chad says. Who wants to play the scribble game? Teddy asks. Then Mr. Rosa comes in. Doodlers, I've got big news. Nate and Dee Dee, 
You won third prize in the Story Spinner's Kids Writing Competition. Third prize, Dee Dee piped out. That's good. Very good, Mr. Rosa continued. The only kids to finish ahead of you were high schoolers. Really? That means we beat Jefferson again, I crow. Yes, Mr. Rosa says with a smile. You've got a winning streak going. Here, they printed the top five entries in the new issue. They did? I say, taking the issue. I'm famous, Dee Dee says. Ahem. We're famous. Dr. Cesspool, starring in From the Gut, by Nate Wright, with special guest artist Dee Dee Holloway. One day at the hospital. It's not fair. What's wrong, doctor? My rival, Dr. Arch Enemy, performs all the important operations. All I get to do is remove people's excess earwax. Squee, squee. Huh? Don't worry, doctor. Your day will come. Suddenly. Help! This man has massive internal injuries. Oh! Doctor, that's the mayor. Egad, this is my big chance. Wheel him into surgery. Go, go. Later. Mayor, the operation was a complete success. Note to reader. Attention, Dee Dee's drawing starts now. I'm here. I'll operate on the mayor. You're too late, Dr. Enemy. I've already saved the mayor's life. Once I removed this pesky little thing, the problem was solved. Pesky little thing? Dr. Enemy exclaimed. Cesspool, you idiot! You remove the mayor's stomach! You're fired! Wait! I've always been chubby, and I've never been able to stick to a diet. But now, without a stomach, I'll have to get thin. It's a foolproof weight loss plan. Dr. Cesspool, you're a genius! The End by N.W. and by D.D.H. Wow, I exclaim. It turned out great. Told you I wouldn't ruin your story, Dee Dee says. It's cool seeing two drawing styles in one comic, Chad added. Yeah, it's unique. I bet that's why you got a prize, Francis says. If you hadn't teamed up, you might not have won anything. Hmm, maybe that's true. Maybe without this cast on my wrist, none of this would have happened. And it all started with my swan dive off that table in the Jefferson food court. Pretty funny, right? It was a total accident. What a lucky break. The End <laughs>